So the minor form of altitude illness is mountain sickness. Right? Mountain sickness doesn't necessarily predict high altitude pulmonary edema or fluid in the lungs, but it's somewhat predictive of high altitude cerebral edema or fluid collection in the brain. So somebody who has mountain sickness really shouldn't be going any higher until they're over their mountain sickness, right? Because if they go up, they could easily get sicker. So they have to be watched um, carefully. How long do they stay at the altitude if they just have mountain sickness? A couple days is usually all it takes. And then they can slowly, then you slow the ascent rate down, you say 500 feet a day, 1,000 feet a day, um, and just take longer to, to go up. Um, people generally ignore the advice, um, but the, you at least give it to them. So the most dangerous mountain right now on Earth for high altitude illness is Kilimanjaro, and the reason is is because people run up that trail um, and they don't acclimatize. All right, and the Himalayas are much higher mountains, but people go slower. Um, and if you think about it, you can compound compound the problem of of dehydration with the infectious diarrhea that everybody gets. So you go up, you go to Nepal, you you know you get you know infectious diarrhea, you're dehydrated, you're tired, you're going up, you're hypoxic. And what you really basically have to tell people to do is just like, let's just take a break. Can you just like stay where you are, get over your diarrhea, hydrate, feel better, and then continue the trip, assuming that they don't have to go back down because they're sicker. If you get sicker, if you go up, the two biggies are high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema, so fluid in the lungs. And that is, it manifests like pulmonary edema from any other cause. Short of breath, cough, um, weakness, um, and they really are desatting at that point. You know, you put them on a pulse oximeter and they're just way low for what the altitude would be. Um, the the life-saving treatment, um, there are two life-saving treatments, um, among other treatments, and those are oxygen, so if oxygen's available, you put people on oxygen and descent, all right? You just reverse the pathophysiology. Different pathophysiology. So as best we know, while there's a lot of you know, stuff about inflammatory response and everything, high altitude pulmonary edema is caused by pulmonary artery hypertension in small blood vessels. So what happens is they have pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction. Those vessels constrict high pressures and they leak um, um, out of those vessels. Um, and it's, um, uh, and the, the tough part about it is you couldn't have been to altitude 100 times and had no problem, do exactly the same trip profile and get sick. So as he was getting older, Sir Edmund Hillary couldn't go to high altitude, the guy that first summited Everest because he when he went to altitude, even with acclimatization or attempted acclimatization, we get high altitude pulmonary edema. So uh, your physiology can change, all right? Um, and, and so the symptoms are the same. If someone has high altitude pulmonary edema, you have to get them out of there, okay? I mean, you can give them drugs to rescue them. You can use bronchodilators. Diuretics don't do a whole lot. Um, actually, a drug that's both prophylactic and a treatment for it um, is Viagra um, or Cialis, and um, the reason is because it lowers pulmonary artery pressure. All right, so we we know what else it does, and you know, you can carry it for wherever you want. But the fact is that that if I had someone who was really sick from high altitude pulmonary edema, I would, and I wanted to throw the the sink at them, um, I would put them on oxygen, give them to Dalafil, um, and um, get them down 